Some people wish God would speak to them more clearly. Like in a burning bush, like with Moses. Or dreams like he did with uh, Joseph. Most Christians agree that God speaks to us primarily through his word. But how do we understand it? For some people, the Bible is like a total mystery. It doesn't have to be. Some people read God's Word like it's a self-help manual, uh, how we can uh, learn to be good, uh, forgiving, kind, to tell the truth, to, to handle today's challenges. But to read the Bible that way is to miss its point. You know, it's possible to read the Bible, study it, maybe use our journals, even memorize verses and miss its essential meaning. God's goal in speaking in the Bible is profound but not complicated. We can say all God's Word comes to us in two words. To understand the Bible rightly, we have to distinguish between these two. If you can distinguish the two, you will be the teacher of the class. Uh, the Bible can be summed up in two words, law and gospel. I want to show you an example of, of law and gospel. This is a scene of, of uh, soldiers coming home from Afghanistan. Uh, there are emotional moments. We've been there twice with our son, who twice came home from Afghanistan, and they, the soldiers stand there information they have some speeches and the you know the families aren't allowed to you know get to them uh, but this one little boy did and so you'll see the the law grace okay I think we're having He's the definition of resiliency, that's for sure. He's waited a long time for this moment with his parents. It's good to be home. His mother, Catherine, Ooh. has waited too. I was longing to hold him. That's all that, all that I thought about. Just this morning, she returned home after serving in Afghanistan with the National Guard's 114th Transportation Company. She'd been apart from her son for nine months. All of a sudden we had to file into the building and get information and I, you know, just look up and Cooper and my mom are right there. But Cooper, oh, he waited long enough. He just kept smiling like he was in awe A moment captured by a Care 11 photographer posted on our Facebook page. So he got grace. Nobody's going to challenge a little kid, you know, running over there. Uh, I'm indebted today to Tulian Chavigian, his, uh, article, God's Word in Two Words in Christianity Today, September 2013. Uh, Tulian is married to Gigi, uh, who's the daughter of uh, Billy Graham. The law is God's word of demand. The gospel is God's word of deliverance. Uh, the law tells us what to do. The gospel tells us what God has done. Now, turn to any page in the Bible and you're going to find one of two things, a verse that demands something from you, like Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder, or a verse that tells you what God has done for you, like Romans 6, 23, for the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything in the Old Testament and New Testament comes in one of these forms. Both law and gospel come from God, so they both are good. Both are necessary, but they have different job descriptions. The law informs us of God's standards. Uh, our daughter Cam came home from University of uh, Montana uh, May 15th. So we had in our uh, family at that time, Cam who's 20, Jamie 18, and Erica 14, and then Jory and me. So we had four drivers and two cars. So one of the rules had to be you can't just take a car, especially if you're 20 and under. Another rule we have is you have to clean up after yourself. Come on, we're a family. You can't just let shoes and clothes and backpacks and dishes pile up. It, the house turned into chaos in a, in a week. Another rule we have is you can't steal from each other. We are a family. You've got to know that your stuff is safe with your family. 
The law informs us of the standards, but it can't change our hearts or make us want to comply. Just because I say, hey, we're all going to clean up after ourselves doesn't mean it happens, folks. Or that people want to even want to make it happen. The law illuminates sin, but it cannot eliminate sin. That's not its job description. The law points to godliness, but it cannot make us godly. The law exposes our sin. You ever said something that's not true? Then you're a liar. You ever put something ahead of God? Then you're an idolater. Want me to keep going? You ever taken something that's not yours? Then you're a thief. You feeling bad yet? I mean, we're all sinners. We need more than the law. We need a Savior. And that's the gospel. The gospel forgives us of sin. The gospel acquits us of sin. The gospel transforms our hearts. It takes a heart that doesn't want to clean up the house and makes it say, you know, I should do this. The law shows us how far, far, how f- far short we fall. Apostle Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall so short of God's high standard of perfection that it would be like us having to jump from Portland to Hawaii. So what do you do? You go get on the KOIN building, you take a running leap, and you fall pitifully short. So then what do you do? You go get a a trainer. You hit the gym, and you particularly work on your legs, and you get new shoes. You come back a month later on the KOIN building, you run, jump. Wow! You go 10 feet further. But you're still pitifully short. The gospel provides us with a bridge. This is, a fir- this is the first in a series of messages called the Bible in two words. The Apostle Paul speaks about these two words in the New Testament book of Galatians. In 48, 49 AD, he wrote the letter to the Galatians. It's the first, the earliest book written in the New Testament. In 47 AD, he took his first missionary journey to the region of Galatia, to the cities of Durba, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. The letter is all about the law and the gospel. Let's start at verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. That's the gospel. Jesus died to rescue rescue us from this present evil age. He goes on in verse 6, Paul speaking to the Galatians, I am astonished that you you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Judaizers came in to the Galatian churches after Paul had left And they said, you know, Christ is not sufficient to bridge you back to God. You also have to be circumcised and keep the Old Testament law. Paul writes to the Galatians and says, I'm amazed how quickly you are turning away from the gospel and going back to the law. There's always something that's attractive to us with the law. My best friend in high school was a guy named Kit Anderson. We swam together on the swim team. We drove to school uh, together every day, taking turns driving. And I asked him one time, I said, Kit, how come you don't believe the gospel of Jesus? He says, I can't believe anything that teaches that uh, 
salvation can be free. There's nothing in life that's free. So I just can't get my arms around a, a teaching that says there's nothing I can do to, to help myself get right with God. Judaizers said the exact same thing. They said salvation cannot be free. You have to do something. You must follow the law. Issues uh, raised about law and gospel in Galatians were at the heart of Martin Luther's Reformation. The church taught uh, in the 16th century that uh, this would be what we call the Catholic Church, that there was a purgatory. No one could achieve heaven and be righteous enough to get into heaven so they had to go to purgatory to purge their sins and that teaching gave rise to the teaching of indulgences if you give gifts to the church we can shorten your time in purgatory how convenient for the church and Luther came in in 521 and this is when the diet of worms came about. Let me tell you, if you're trying to shed a few pounds this summer, this, this diet works. I mean, your, your weight will drop like the stock market. So, 1521, Luther comes into the diet of worms, means the same thing as the council of worms. And he says... And it was based on his work that he had just done in Galatians. He said, we're, not, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, not by indulgences, not by purgatory. Verse 11, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You may wonder, how did the Judaizers get the Galatians to peel, peel away from Paul and, and, and take their teaching instead? They did it by calling into question Paul's authority. They said, you know, he's not an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He got all his information secondhand. Do you remember uh, Peter in uh, Acts 1 when it's time to replace Judas uh, to add the 12th uh, apostle? He said it has to be an eyewitness, someone who is with us, with Jesus, heard Jesus teach, saw his death, and saw his resurrection. And they, these people came into Galatians and said, Paul's none of those things. You can't believe him. But Paul says, oh no. I received it straight from Christ on the road to Damascus. I am an eyewitness. 13, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul says, I know all about the law. I was more zealous for the law of anybody else in Judaism. 15, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to, in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. He says, God chose me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. I got this from God. 17, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Paul says, I didn't learn the message from the apostles. I went away to Arabia for three years. It was just me and God and Jesus. Verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James. James is... Uh, the Lord's younger brother, half-brother, who became the leader of the New Testament church. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is, is no lie. The emphasis in that whole sentence is, I was only with Peter and James, and it was only for 15 days. It's not a long, that's not a long time, folks. 21, then I went to Syria and Cilicia. 
Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. This is uh, the famous meeting in Acts 15, recorded in Acts 15, uh, where there's, uh, you know, about this whole Galatian issue and law and gospel. So Paul says, when I talk about the law and the gospel, I know what I'm talking about because I receive these things straight from God. Paul says, we know no one can be saved by the law. No one can jump from Portland to Hawaii. It's too far from us as sinners to God's holiness. So why foolish Galatians? Would you want to go back to living by the law? When I taught you, salvation can only be by grace. When we focus on the law, we begin to become enamored with external things like our appearance. A young gal was a nightclub singer and her friend told her about Jesus and she became a Christian. She was a brand new Christian, all excited. And she got invited by a church nearby to sing at their Sunday morning service, like right here. So she picked out the song she thought would be perfect. She picked out what she was going to wear. And she got up there and she sang her heart out. And when she's done, people clapped. And, but one elderly came up afterward and elderly woman said, I can't imagine you would sing a song like that. She sang it in kind of this torchy nightclub style. I can't imagine you do that. And God can't possibly be pleased with the way you're dressed. This girl was taken aback and burst into tears and ran off. We're seduced into living by the law only when we misunderstand the law and its purpose. Or we have too low a view of the law. A low view of the law makes us think we can keep it. The bar is low enough that we think we can jump over. A low view of the law makes us think that its standards are attainable. A high and proper view of the law demolishes all such confidence. A high view of the law helps us recognize that God demands absolute perfection. Jesus states it. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Like my friend Kit, we're all going to naturally be suspicious of unconditional grace. <coughs> as long as we think our moral efforts might be sufficient. It's only when we realize that we're too far from God's high holiness to attain Him on our own efforts that we realize unconditional grace is the only way. Often you hear that cheap law is a big enemy of the church. Cheap law is when a person commits their life to Christ and they learn that God forgives them and they learn that, you know what, I sin again, God will keep forgiving me. And so they begin to say things like, it really doesn't matter how I live, I'll just always be forgiven. But as big an enemy of the church is cheap law. Cheap law tells us that if we've fallen, there's good news, you can get up again. Therein lies the great heresy of cheap law. It is a false gospel. It makes you think that somehow you can reach God without grace. The truth is we can never reach God's high, holy, perfect standard but by the mercy of God through Christ's death on the cross. The Bible can be summed up in two words, law and gospel. God's law reveals our desperation. God's gospel reveals our deliverer. If the law were the one word of God, if the Bible was basically a book of instruction, we would be doomed. But there's another word, gospel. Jesus fulfilled all God's commands completely and died for our sins so God could offer us unconditional grace. The Bible is one long story of God meeting our rebellion with his rescue, our sin with his forgiveness, our guilt with his grace. The overwhelming focus of the Bible is not on the work of the redeemed, but the work of the Redeemer. 
which means the Bible is not an instruction manual for Christian living, but a revelation book of Jesus, who is the answer to our unchristian living. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul's work to hear, here, writing to the Galatians, and it's still totally relevant to us today. We're still enamored by the law like the Galatians were. We still think we have to do more than faith in Christ's death. That somehow we have to please God with what we do. Help us not to fall back into that dreadful impossibility. Lord, we... <clears throat> Thank you that you love us and Jesus died for our sins so we could have full acceptance with you if we put our faith in Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, you're not sure, you could do it right now. You just pray, Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you died on the cross for me and I need forgiveness. There's no other way I can be accepted before God. I'll serve you. Would you please come into my life? Maybe you've already committed your life to Christ and your message to him today would be, God, help me. I think I've kind of fallen back into the law stuff, the merit, and I'm trying to think I'm impressing people or you by how good I act, what I do. Help me not to do that. Everybody pray. I'll give you a few seconds. Thank you, Lord, for your law that tells us the standards, how high and holy they are and that we can't attain them. And thank you for the gospel that tells us what you've done through Christ's death on the cross to provide us a, 